Right. Wow. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta. Our service this morning is called Light and Enlightenment. And I want to welcome you to our beloved community, those of you who are visiting especially for the first time. We're here acting together to create a community that represents compassion, reason, and respect. And this empowers us to make a just society. Here in the CSRA, we reside on the lands of the Westos people, the Savannah Shawnee, the Yuchi, Iyuchi people, so the Muskogee Confederacy and Feedback. And today, I'm co-creating the service with Joseph Patchen and the talented folks troubleshooting in our tech deck. And all of you shaping this moment together. So we have a lot going on here at the UUCA. Those of you who were here yesterday got to see some of it. When Reverend Nick put a ring on it. He's our guy now. How about that? I like that. He's changing a lot of things. But whenever I see him and Jenea, uh, they just have so much energy. They just have so much imagination for what they can do here. And I always admire that. And Reverend Nick has a quality of audacity, and as a creative person, that is the quality I admire most in creative people. He's not afraid to take a chance. I like Reverend Nick, and I like his family. And I'm very curious to see what Noah and Charlie are going to turn out like if they're still here. In I love to see the kids grow up. So the other announcements we have <coughs> September. September 10th, the worship will return to 11 a.m., okay? So September 10, if you're here at 11.15, you're late. We have our final Friday jazz on August 25th. That's a Friday, the last Friday of this month. Uh, tickets are $20 uh, and $10 for military and students. And you can get them online at the UU Augusta slash jazz, or you can get them at the door. And that will be the Rob Foster Quartet. If you're a fan of the Miller, you've seen Rob Foster perform there many times with other rock bands. We also have on September 10, Sunday, September 10, the same day that we go back to 11 a.m., uh, a program fair, all right? So stay after the uh, worship service to find out about all the different ways that you can volunteer for one or more teams <clears throat> and committees that are vital to our mission and program. As a part of our shared ministry, we're all stewards of work. And if the idea of volunteering for anything still makes you cringe, a lot of this volunteering will be for the kids. And there's just nothing like learning how to see kids. I'm always up here telling people to try to learn to see Christ in other people. And I can tell you it's a lot easier to see God in little kids than it is in grown-ups. So this is good for your spiritual practice and it's good for your spiritual family. Also, September 27th at 1130, 1130, September 27th, we're going to be having uh, programs. It's adult education programs are going to begin again. Thank you, Reverend Nick. Uh, the first one is called Creating Theology Together. This is the opening retreat or advance, depending on how you look on these things. Creating Theology Together. This is a new year-long faith formation program. Uh, Unitarians have always been a little bit at a disadvantage from other religions, in my opinion, because we don't have a specific path. You don't have Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. You don't have your path to salvation. We're just not that kind of church. But wouldn't you like to know what you are as Unitarian Universalists? And wouldn't you like to know what it is that you believe and not just what people tell you you're supposed to believe? That's why you come here. So we're going to be having Creating Theology together September 27th. And you'll have a chance to start to work on that in your interior life. So as always, we hope you can linger with us after the worship service for conversation and fellowship, cookies and coffee and stuff in the common room. 
And if you're on Zoom or with you're with us in person in our common room, we welcome you always as part of our spiritual family. Our chalice lighting this morning <clears throat> comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. You are the light of the world. Out of your spirit for our opening hymn, Let There Be Light. Now is the time when we sing our children out. These are the words of Albert Einstein. I'm not an atheist, and I don't think I can call myself a pantheist. I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. This is a time in our service for prayer and meditation, especially meditation. And since I got uh, a minute to be up here, I want to put in a plug for the meditation group that meets on Monday, tomorrow, here at 6.30. 6.30, I open the kitchen door. And if you don't know how to meditate, we'll teach you. If you're curious about meditation, we'll help you learn about it. And if you know how to meditate, Meditating in a group with other people is like playing in a really good rock band. You just, you just got something which is bigger than the sum of its parts. It's really good. It's the difference between a solo album and a Beatles album. <laughs> All right? Also, there's Zoom, right? OK, we have Zoom. Friday. Friday, Friday Zoom. If you get the e announcements, the link, for the Zoom meditation is on Friday. What time on Friday? Seven. Seven. All right. Thank you. And also, if you're interested in the Zoom, grab onto E. McNabb. 
She is the founder of our meditation group. And if you're interested in uh, live meditation, come see me. I'll talk your ear off about it. Okay. So, meanwhile, we'll keep it simple. No levitation, no astral projection allowed. All right. Uh, we'll have one minute of silence. I'll mind the time. Most important thing about meditation in the beginning is posture. Try to have as straight a back as you can. Try not to be leaning against the back of your chair. Lift your chest a little bit. Take a deep breath and let your mind settle. Anybody remember what Jane Page said yesterday? Pay up, show up, rise up. Okay, so far, two out of three. Now it's time, if you want to dance, you got to pay the band. And we're all glad you're here. And speaking for myself, this is the best money I spend all week. Because being here gives me the one thing that I get to keep, all right? The Buddhists, they talk about uh, the three precious jewels. Number one, life is impermanent. You're gonna die. Uh, it may not seem real to you, but when you hit 70, it starts to become real. You're gonna die. You don't know the time of your death. You don't know how you're gonna die, but you're gonna die somehow. The only thing you get to keep is the peace of mind that you create. And the way you find peace of mind is through your action and service to other people. Meditation is good. Taking care of other people is better. And now's your chance to do that. Will the ushers please come forward?
For your generosity, we thank you. I imagine at some time in your life, if you went to church or not, you probably heard Jesus quoted as saying, I am the light of the world, and I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Well, if that's all it is, that doesn't mean anything to you. And good for you, Jesus, aren't you special? You know? What about me? Now, the thing that you may not have heard is that he said that one time in the Gospels. Twice, possibly three, he said, you are the light of the world. Now, what's interesting about that, or at least the way it's written, is he doesn't say you will be, or you could be, or you should be, or you ought to be, or maybe if you pray real hard, you'll become the light of the world. Jesus. All right, anyway. He said, you... You are now the light of the world. That's interesting. Thank you. The Buddhists say you already have Buddha nature. You're already enlightened. You're just confused. That sounds like you're talking about something big. If Jesus says, I am the light of the world, to me, to my ear, that sounds small. It sounds evangelistic. It brings up all the rough ideas I grew up with. But if Jesus says, you are the light of the world, you have Buddha nature, then I want to know what that means. What does it mean to be the light of the world? Who are you? In fact, if you look at the larger question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I don't mean in this church. Uh, when I was meditating a few years ago, that thought came to me like a nudge. It said, what are you doing here? This planet and this galaxy sitting on this cushion. How did you get that deal? See? When you think about it, Dalai Lama said that to have a human life is as rare and as precious as a lifesaver from a boat floating on the ocean and a turtle sticking his head up in that life preserver. That's how unusual and anomalous it is to be born as a human being. And you think about the time that you're living in, there's so much stuff going on. It seems like the world is on fire. It seems like history is moving so fast. We just can't seem to keep up with it. What an interesting time it is to be here. How did you get that deal? You are the light of the world. What is light? What is light? Light is not something that you really see. Light is what reveals what you see. Think about that. You don't really see light. What you actually see is light reflected off of options in your world. Light is what reveals. So if Jesus says you are the light of the world, and if light is what reveals the world, then that gets kind of interesting to me. So, if all, all this stuff about the Bible says, and what Jesus says, is making you kind of tired, like if you've heard all this before, then let's... Let's, uh, let's take all this religious stuff and just pack it up and put it over here for a minute. Let's go at this from another direction. Quantum physics. I love quantum physics. Just you for a second. Quantum physics. That's how this works. Hi. I'll just talk loud. Mm. I've been reading books about quantum physics. I've been watching TV shows about quantum physics, man. It's amazing. I love quantum physics. I don't understand any of it. 
It doesn't make any sense. But the amazing thing is that the people who really understand it and work with it, they don't understand it either. And they'll be the first ones to tell you it doesn't make any sense. But it's true. And they know it's true. And if that doesn't sound like religion, I don't know what. All right? So quantum physics, how that started, you had, there was around 1912, there's a guy named Max Planck. And he was trying to solve a problem because physicists were saying that they couldn't figure out if light was a particle or if it was a wave. You can demonstrate that life, that light is a wave by just taking a piece of cardboard and cutting some holes in it with a pocket knife. You can look that up. You cut three holes in it and you'll get six shadows. That's because light is a wave. But light is also a particle. How can it be both at the same time? See? So there was a guy named Werner uh, Heisenberg. All you fans of Breaking Bad may know that name. Heisenberg. Heisenberg was trying to figure this out, and he said, the problem that you have is that you can know the position of a particle of light, but you can't know the velocity. And if you know the velocity, you can't know the position. So that's, he came up with something called the uncertainty principle, which means you can only know this thing, but you can't know this thing at the same time, even though both of these things exist. Now. There were two guys who really hated that idea. One was Einstein, and the other was a guy named Erwin Schrodinger. Now, the way that when you're, when you're a physicist, you're either working with things that are very big, like galaxies and space-time, or you're working with things that are very, very tiny, like quarks and bosons, the things that make up particles and atoms. So, it's very difficult to measure those things in a laboratory. So what you do is you have thought experiments. Now, you could say that actually Jesus was the pioneer of thought experiments because he was describing something very difficult, too. He was trying to describe to people what the kingdom of heaven was. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a, sowing, a guy sowing a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a vineyard. He's making all these parables and stories to try to describe something that doesn't fit into words very easy. That's what a thought experiment is. Here's a good example of a thought experiment is one that comes from Einstein. When Einstein was trying to make the foundations of his theory of general relativity, general relativity, the key is relativity. This is Einstein's thought experiment. He said, Imagine that you are standing alongside of a railroad track. You're standing alongside of a railroad track. And there's a train going by. And you're watching the train going by pretty fast. Now, now imagine that on this train, standing in the aisle, there's a, there's a young girl. She's kind of bored. And she's got a rubber ball. And she's standing in the aisle of the train going by, and she's bouncing this ball up and down. Right? So it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now you, standing on the side of the railroad track, you see the girl and her ball whizzing by. But for you, the ball is not going up and down. The ball is going sideways. The ball for you is going boing, 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 boing. So the girl standing by the ball sees it going up and down. You standing way over there see it going sideways. Which one of you is right? Which one of you is right? You're both right. That doesn't make any sense. But that's the nature of relativity. Relativity depends on the position of the observer. The position of the observer. You are the light of the world. Light reveals. 
So the position of the observer says it's going boing, boing, boing. The person next to the object is going up and down. That's Heisenberg's problem. You can't measure velocity and position at the same time. The girl is seeing position. You, standing by the railroad track, are seeing velocity. And yet both of you are correct, even though both of you are seeing something entirely different. It's relativity. Now, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle really got under Max Planck's skin. He was one of the early founders of quantum physics. So he said, maybe what it is, light is not just a wave or a particle. Maybe it's a quantum. Maybe it's a little packet of light that we will call quantum, quantum physics. And so it can be a particle and a wave at the same time. Really? He didn't like that idea, even though it was his own idea. And it was the only idea that fit and made sense. He didn't like it. So he made up a thought experiment of his own called Schrodinger's cat. You may have heard the phrase Schrodinger's cat, but if you didn't know where it came from, this is where it comes from. Schrodinger's cat was a joke. It was a joke. Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, composed this thought experiment to say what nonsense the uncertainty principle was. Except that when he made this thought experiment, all the other physicists involved in quantum physics said, well, Schrodinger, the bad news is you're right. This is true. Here's the experiment. So you have a cardboard box right and the lid is closed now inside of this box there's a cat there's a bottle of powerful poison it kills you like instantly poison a little hammer and there's a geiger counter hooked to the hammer and next to the geiger counter there's a piece of decaying radioactive material so if the radioactive material spits out a particle when the Geiger counter clicks, the hammer will smash and the cat will die immediately. So now here's the riddle. Right now, is the cat still alive or is the cat already dead? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. The cat is alive, but also the cat is dead just like the girl with her ball and you by the train. These are two contradictory opposing states that are nevertheless existing together. This is, in quantum physics, this is called a superposition state. A superposition state. You have two opposing, contradictory states of reality that are nevertheless true. And when you open the box, to see how that cat's doing, the cat is dead, or maybe the cat is alive, happy to get out of the box. So, what decides if the cat is alive or dead? You. You did that. You killed the cat by opening the box. Oh, the cat's dead. That's it. The cat, that's reality. That's the universe you're in now. You're in a universe with a dead cat in a box. You open up the box and the cat jumps out. Oh, the cat's alive. That's you. You're in a universe where that cat didn't die yet. You, the light of the world, revealed that. Now that is really interesting. Does it make any sense? No. No. See, now you may have thought that the Bible was weird. You may have thought that there was stuff in the Bible that didn't make any sense. This is what weird really looks like. But here's the thing. It's dead nuts true. Schrodinger's cat is simply the most validated and proven experiment in modern physics. It is dead nuts true. And the evidence for that is in your pocket. The evidence for Schrodinger's cat is in your pocket, or it's in your purse, or it's on your belt, or it's going off during the service. Your cell phone 
is based on transistors, tiny transistors and transducers that are based on quantum physics. They are based on superpositions being transformed continuously into collapsed positions. When you open the box and you figure out what's going on with the cat, the cat has transformed from a superposition state to a collapsed position state. That's what it's called. And that is how your phone works. And relativity, the girl with the ball, and the guy standing beside the train. And by the way, the girl bouncing the ball on the train, time is passing different from her than it is for the guy standing beside the train. Relativity. And you know what else works on that? The GPS on your phone is based on relativity theory, and it works. It makes sense, but it works. The communications satellites that are floating above the Earth, communicating with your position right here, those satellites, time is passing more slowly Time is passing more slowly for those satellites in a reduced gravity in space than time is passing for you on the Earth. On the surface of the Earth, gravity causes time to move more quickly. And if you're a GPS technician, you have to factor for that. You have to use relativity to make sure that the slow time in space and the fast time on Earth are synced up. If you didn't factor in relativity, your GPS would be off by as much as 300 meters because time in space is different from time on Earth, and it's not that far out in space. Relativity is true. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's true. The Earth does not go around the sun. The Earth does not go around the sun. Sorry, Copernicus. Sorry, Kepler. You were close. It only looks like it goes around the sun. Does that make sense? But it's true. Look it up. Look it up. So the point is, you are the light of the world. You are constantly changing, transforming superposition states into collapsed position states. You are surrounded by a sea of dead cats and living cats. Every move you make, every breath you take, every thought you think, every word you speak is constantly changing superposition states and collapsed position states. You are the light of the world, not just in a mystical sense, but in a metaphysical sense, and in a scientific sense, you are the light of the world. You are actually bending reality. We always thought President 45 was the only one who could bend reality. But the fact is, you bend reality all the time. You are creating the reality that you inhabit in your mind and realistically around you by the quantum physics of superposition and collapsed position states. Every word you speak, every thought you think, every move you make, every breath you take is creating the reality that we inhabit. Now, if that stuff sounds really weird, let's put that right over here next to religion. Talk about entropy. Entropy. Entropy is all about how high energy states come down to low energy states. It's about transformation and very often is associated with things that are dissolving or, dissolute or deteriorating. But it's not always about deterioration. It's about changing one state of high energy to a state of lower energy and reaching stability. Easy example, a glass of hot tea. Put some ice cubes in the tea, the tea gets cooler, the ice melts and gets warmer, and finally it just finds a temperature and stays there. That's entropy. So I was saying, what are you doing here? Not what are you doing in this building, what are you doing on this planet? 
What are you doing on this planet right now in this time period in history? You know, scientists, they have a kind of a uh, fake humility in a way of saying the Earth is an ordinary planet. It's just an ordinary planet. There's a zillion planets out there. And we are revolving around a very ordinary yellow sun and a very ordinary, not very big galaxy. Ordinary, ordinary, nothing special. Mm, I don't think I, I agree with that. I mean, they know more than I do, but I don't think I agree with that. Statistically, you've got nine planets, including poor old Pluto, right? And of all these nine planets, there's only one that has anything going on. You know, life, okay? We have life. But you know what? This is a very busy planet. The geology of this planet is very dynamic. It's constantly changing and changing. And this planet is so filled with organisms and life of all kinds for billions of years. This is a very busy planet. I would say that this is a very high entropy planet. You take a place like the moon, there's nothing going on there. There is nothing going on there. If you went to the moon, and had a way of seeing it a million years ago, it would look exactly the same way it does now. It might have a few more craters now, but it's the same old stuff. It's exciting for maybe an hour, and that's it. When you've seen it, you've seen it. But if you saw this planet a million years ago, it would look very different, especially a planet without human beings. It would be very different without human beings. Human beings the light of the world, the collapser of superposition states, you guys, our species is a very, very high energy species. We are the baddest predators, pack hunting predators that have existed in the history of life on Earth. If there were tyrannosaurs around today like Jurassic Park, pretty soon they would be running away from us. Tastes just like chicken. Right? Yeah. So we are probably at this time the age of the Anthropocene, the age of man. The Anthropocene, the age of man, scientists figure from about the early 1950s because that's when the impact of human activity became felt in the atmosphere and in the geology. This is the age of man. We are driving this Earth so fast and so hard that the Earth itself cannot keep up with what we are doing to it. Animals are designed to adapt to whatever happens to this planet, and they have a hard time adapting to what we're doing to this planet. This is a mass extinction. Scientists are saying this might be the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history. And this time, it's not an asteroid. And this time it's not volcanoes. And this time it's not carbon uh, coming from uh, eruptions and gases on the Earth. This is something that we are doing to it. We are very high entropy collapsers of superposition states. We are the light of the Earth that reveals. So my last point is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And I don't just mean, there's not a lot you can do about to change the, the carbon. I mean, you can drive an electric car. That's nice. And you can recycle, and that's a nice thing. I don't know how much it's going to change. But remember that you are the benders of reality. You are the creators of the reality that you inhabit. And if you need a good reason for spiritual practice, if you need a good reason to learn to meditate or have compassion or be of service to other people, that's a good reason. You are the drivers of entropy in this world. And if all this talk about Jesus and salvation and stuff, as I've said, let's look at it in a different way. If you read the Gospels yourself, what you'll find is that Jesus had very little interest in sin. Quite the opposite. He was the one who wanted to include people. The only people that Jesus got really angry with 
were the people who were obsessed with sin and the sin management of other people. Those were the people who made him mad. Jesus didn't like very rich people, and he didn't like very religious people. But people who understood about suffering and hunger and anger were the people he could talk to because they were open to compassion. They were open to new ideas. So what if we redefine what Christianity is? What if we redefine what a Christian is? What if we say a Christian is not obsessed with sin? And a Christian is not obsessed with sin management of me or anybody else. What if a Christian is somebody who wants to see Christ in everything? The book of John said, I am the way that uh, the word was with God, and the word was God, and all things were made through the word. I say that word is Christ. Christ is not Jesus' name. Christ is an aspect of the universal unmanifested consciousness that underlies existence. Ever since the discovery of the Higgs boson, scientists have been talking about something called the zero point quantum field. And there is a new theory called emergent, uh, what do they call it? Emergent, transcendent emergence, which makes the possibility that this universal zero point quantum field is aware and that this is the source of all matter and all energy including quantum physics that the source this zero point quantum field this higgs field is aware interesting thought what if we tried to see that higgs field and other people what if we tried to see that zero point quantum field and other people what if you try to see Christ in other people? Wouldn't that be better than trying to see what's wrong with them? And wouldn't that be closer to what the actual Jesus was about? Transformation and connection. You are the light of the world. You don't have to like it, but you are. Amen. Would you rise in body rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn number ten fifty eight BR's a religion? These are also the words of Albert Einstein. A human being is a part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and his feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This is Einstein. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison restricting us to our personal desires and to the affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this, position, this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. <laughs> 